Hello everyone, and welcome to tonight's panel, 100 Years of Notorious Women, Voting Rights and Equal Rights. My name is Lauren Daniels, and I am the Student Program Chair for the Conference on World Affairs, as well as a Junior in Aerospace Engineering here at CU Boulder. Tonight's panel is a part of a new series of monthly events designed to keep our audience engaged year-round. This panel in particular holds a special place in my heart, as this year will be my first opportunity to vote in a presidential election. While voting seems like a commonplace and simple thing, I cannot help but remember the scores of women who have come before me in order to fight for this basic right. Similarly, I cannot forget that while white women are celebrating the right to vote, other groups such as African Americans and Native Americans still have years to go before being able to celebrate their 100th anniversary. I am inspired by how far we have come, and I am humbled by how far we still need to go. Thank you for joining us for this discussion on the evolution of women's right to vote, as well as how the female voice impacts policy change. Enjoy the panel. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Christina Walbrecht, and it's my real pleasure um, and privilege uh, to welcome you uh, to our event tonight um, and to thank you for joining the CU Boulder Conference on World Affairs virtual uh, panel, 100 Years of Notorious Women, Women's Right, uh, excuse me, Voting Rights and Equal Rights. Uh, this event is being brought to you in partnership with the uh, CU Boulder LaCroix, excuse me, Leroy uh, Keller Center for the Study of the First Amendment and the Boulder Jewish Community Center. Um, you are in for a real treat tonight. Um, we have a really exciting uh, group of activists and scholars um, to talk to us about these important issues, both historically um, and today. Uh, my name is Christina Walbrecht. I'm a professor of political science and the director of the Rooney Center for the Study of American Democracy at the University of Notre Dame. Uh, my research focuses on uh, women voters after suffrage, uh, and particularly uh, trying to take a historic view of, of women voters uh, across the last 100 years. Um, it's my honor to be the moderator today uh, uh, for this panel with um, these three uh, great panelists. Uh, for uh, time, I'm going to introduce them each uh, right now, uh, and then each of them will provide us with about uh, five to seven minutes of introductory material. We'll have a discussion, uh, and then we'll uh, welcome your Q&A. Um, if you do have questions for any of our panelists, I encourage you to just right below, you can see that Q&A button, click on there, enter any questions. Um, I, together with the um, Center for uh, World Affairs, uh, excuse me, Conference on World Affairs, will be going through those questions and bringing them to our panelists. So our first panelist is Colleen Jenkins. Uh, Colleen is a legislator, author, and television producer who also happens to be the great-great-granddaughter of suffragist Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Colleen is the co-founder and president of the Elizabeth Cady Stanton Trust, a collection of 3,000 objects of women's suffrage memorabilia that is lent to museums, libraries, producers, television, et cetera. Uh, she has, um, excuse me, the trust lending practice fulfills its mission to preserve the history of the women's rights movement, to educate the public on that history, um, and to promote the advancement of women's rights. In 2018, Colleen uh, testified before the US Senate, which contributed to their decision to pass federal legislation, creating a national trail of historic sites coordinated by the Women's Rights National Historic Park, known as the National Votes for Women Trail. Uh, she is also the vice president of Monumental Women, a nonprofit dedicated to breaking the bronze ceiling over New York Central Park by erecting the first statue of real women, Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, and Sojourner Truth, in celebration of the centennial of the 19th Amendment. Uh, our second uh, uh, panelist is Denise Lieberman. Uh, Denise is a civil rights lawyer and serves as general counsel of the Missouri Voter Protection Coalition a nonpartisan statewide uh, uh, network of voter advocates. She is a nationally recognized voting rights expert and has testified on voting rights before Congress and most recently served as Director of Power and Democracy for the Advancement Project National Office in Washington, DC. Denise is also the Faculty Director of the Voter Access and Engagement Initiative at Washington University in St. Louis, uh, my own alma mater, uh, where she is an adjunct professor of law and political science. Uh, Denise has been at the forefront of voting rights debates in her home state of Missouri, 
and across the country. Um, she was a little late to our prep meeting because she was literally doing voting rights training before um, this event. Um, she is a counsel of record in two lawsuits challenging aspects of Missouri's absentee and mail-in voting procedures to ensure safe and accessible voting amid this pandemic. In her role with the Missouri Voter Protection Coalition, she coordinates statewide nonpartisan election protection efforts in Missouri. I was not kidding when I told you guys that this is an impressive panel. Um, I'm also uh, delighted to introduce to you um, Sally Numa, uh, an award-winning scholar, advocate, and filmmaker. This is not a normal combination of things. This is a really spectacular talent whose work explores issues of race, gender, education policy, and political behavior. She holds a PhD in political science from Northwestern and is currently a tenure track Professor of Urban Politics in Human Development and Social Policy at Northwestern. She previously worked at the Duke University Sanford School of Public Policy, was a postdoc at Princeton, uh, a Women in Public Policy uh, Fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School, and a pre-doctoral fellow at the University of Pennsylvania. Those are all really easy things to get and lots of people do those incredibly impressive things. Her first book, How Girls Achieve, offered an insightful, deeply researched examination of the state of education for girls and offered a vision of feminist schools that will actively teach girls how to, how and when to challenge society's norms and allow them to carve out their own paths to success. Um, as the mother of two girls, uh, I love this. Uh, among her many commendations, uh, uh, Sally has been named Forbes Magazine's 30 Under 30 in Education, received the Clarence Stone Award from the American Political Science Association, Urban Politics Section, and was the recipient of a Andrew Carnegie Fellowship. Um, I'm sure I've now convinced you that these are people you wanna listen closely to. We're gonna start with uh, Colleen, then move on to Sally, and, and finally end with Denise. Uh, so Colleen, please take it away. Thank you so much. I welcome everybody to my home. That's the value of Zoom. And I would like to introduce you to my family. Uh, I would like to enter the story of history through my family. Here are three generations of my family. This is Elizabeth Cady Stanton. This, and I, I'm going to focus on her, but I want you to know that she had a daughter, Harriet, and her daughter had Nora. Harriet was an, a big New York State suffrage organizer with big parades up Fifth Avenue and lobbying in the state capital of Albany. And uh, this is her, grand, her daughter, Nora, who not only was involved with the suffrage movement, but she worked on the Equal Rights Amendment. And for Lauren, who introduced us to this uh, session, who's a aerospace engineer, I want you to know that Nora was the first female civil engineer to graduate from Cornell and one of the first in the nation. Um, here, Nora is joining us. She could not, not be here. <laughs> so what I'd like to do is tell you a little bit about uh, Elizabeth. And the crux of the issue is her relationship with law and how she connected women and law. Well, how do you do that? Well, first of all, you grow up in a big soup of law. Everything around you is law, 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 law. Here she is in, as a child in upstate New York near the capital of Albany. You can't talk about her being a child without talking about her father. Judge Katie. Judge Katie presided down the street at the courthouse when Elizabeth was born. He was elected to Congress. He eventually became a Supreme Court judge in the state of New York. Another crucial thing is that his law office was attached to their home. And Elizabeth, as a child, could see. Uh, clients come in, knock on the door, come in and say, I must speak with the judge. I must speak with the attorney. So Flora Campbell came. Uh, she was very distraught when she came. Elizabeth as a child noticed her. 
Flora Campbell went in and talked to Judge Katie and she came out just as distraught. So as a child, Elizabeth is going to fix the problem because she understands there is a problem. And what she plans to do is sneak in to her father's law office where there are a whole bunch of books, law books. And what she plans to do is she plans to take a pair of scissors as a child and cut out those nasty paragraphs that made the women so unhappy. See? So her father got wind of the plan. And he basically, before it was executed, he said, before you cut up my law books, realize that it doesn't make a difference because these law books are throughout the state of New York. And he said, and this is his fatal flaw because he's quite a conservative person where she's already breaking away with her thoughts. Uh, she actually, he tells her, you have to go to the legislature and appeal to them as a woman. Of course, she's appealing to an all male legislature. I'm talking about the early 1800s. And uh, so she, in fact, grows up and does exactly that, appeals to the New York State, addresses the New York State legislature. So she's getting, at a very young age, an education in the law. And here's another thing that happened. In their home, of course, law clerks would be studying with the judge, and they baited Elizabeth as a child. For instance, she had just gotten this coral necklace as a Christmas present. And one of the clerks said, who owns that necklace? And Elizabeth said, I do. I got it as a present. He says, when you get married, your husband will own it. And if he wishes, he can swap this for cigars and light the cigar and your necklace will go up in smoke. That was the law. Women once married had, were dead in the eyes of the law. They ceased to exist. They couldn't contract for their, even though they had wages, they did not have the ability to control them. They did not own their children. They did not own the clothes on their back. Of course, they didn't vote. They didn't serve in office. They didn't serve on juries. So this is going into her head as a young woman. Now I want to fast forward to her marriage at 25. Who does she marry? An abolitionist attorney. And where do they go for their honeymoon? You might think that they go to Buffalo, Niagara Falls, just west, but instead they go east to London, to the world's first anti-slavery convention. Now that's an unusual honeymoon, but so be it. So Elizabeth goes obviously as the bride of Henry Brewster Stanton. So she doesn't have any standing in that convention. But one of the things that happens is that another woman crosses the Atlantic Ocean in 1840 as a delegate to the World Anti-Slavery Convention. Now I'm going to ask you to think, what do you think was the first order of business for that anti-slavery convention? you could imagine perhaps they would discuss slavery and abolishing slavery. That would be logical. The first order of business was whether women should be allowed to talk or not talk. And you can say Elizabeth, well, the bride, um, but Lucretia Mott was a delegate and the decision was that women shall not talk. What happens is Elizabeth meets Lucretia. Elizabeth Cady Stanton meets Lucretia Mott and they talk and they basically agree 
we have a problem as women. We as women need to work on that problem. When we return to the United States, what we'll do is we'll have the first women's rights convention. And perhaps you all know that in 1848, in a matter of a few days, because Lucretia Mott is up in upstate New York in Seneca Falls nearby visiting. So in just five days, they arrange this convention and uh, they're pulling their hair out. Like, what is the document that we present to the world or to present at our convention? What do we do? And what's really interesting in Elizabeth Cady Stanton's hometown as a child, every 4th of July, they read the Declaration of Independence. And I hope you can help me. It says, all men are created equal. They're endowed with certain inalienable rights, among them life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Well, that was an annual event, July 4th. And fast forward back to the first Women's Rights Convention, what they decide is we're going to have our own Declaration of Independence for women. And why not have irrefutable arguments based on a revolution that was very recent in the minds of Americans? In fact, Elizabeth Cady Stanton's father fought in the Amer grandfather fought in the Gra American Revolution. So this is truly on their minds. And what the women do just prior to the convention, uh, they uh, come up with the phrase, all men and women are created equal. And the rest is history. It is the basis of a very long process of 75 years to amend the constitution in order to guarantee the citizens' right to vote. It is the world's greatest bloodless revolution. And I look forward to tossing this panel over to Sally because she's going to pick up in the late 1800s. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Yes, so this is a great segue. Um, I'm going to really begin uh, kind of from where I sit. So as Christina mentioned, I am a professor at Northwestern University, and I'm also a graduate of Northwestern University. Uh, and this fall, my alma mater and current place of employment, Northwestern, celebrated what they called 150 years of women. That is 150 years since women could enroll as Northwestern undergraduate students. You might already notice that if we're celebrating suffrage, the 100 year anniversary of suffrage, that that meant that Northwestern was among the first waves of, waves of colleges to educate women alongside men in the 1860s and 70s. And so that meant you can earn a BA at Northwestern University as a woman, even before you had the right to vote. And so as you might imagine, this was quite controversial. Uh, so much so that it would be another 100 years before several other schools, including some Ivy League institutions, allowed women to enroll along with men. So for instance, Harvard University did not admit its first woman until 1920. Again, that's 60 years after, for example, Northwestern. 1920, of course, is also the same year that white women secured the right to vote. Now, I am not gonna go through the history of, of all of that in great detail. Our moderator and other people here, I'm sure could talk more on this topic. But what I will say and what we do know is that the suffrage movement was inclusive to the extent that black women such as anti-lynching advocate Ida B. Wells and civil rights leader Mary Church Terrell, to name a few, participated in its development. We know that. But it was ultimately exclusive to the extent that these incredible Black women leaders were still asked to march um, in an all Black assembly at the back of some of these marches. So we can see here the ways in which from some of the origins of the suffrage movement, it was um, also the case that it often reproduced many of the inequalities that it fought against. 
So it would take another half century before Black women were fully enfranchised through the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Well, since then, uh, women have made good on the rights afforded to them, um, at least in the contemporary period. Not only do they vote more than men, but Black women in particular vote at some of the highest rates in the nation, wavering between 70 and 60% since 2012. Um, that's compared to the nation, which is like hovering around 40%. Black women are also among the most educated group in the United States in terms of enrollment and completion. So for example, the as of 2016, the National Center for Education Statistics um, actually uh, reported that the share of bachelor's degrees earned by female students in 2016 were 64% uh, for Black students. Um, as compared to 56% for white students. So we can see, again, those differences. But where I come in as a scholar, what's especially interesting to me is this fact, that the percent of women across race who have enrolled and completed college has outnumbered men in this country since the 1980s. And yet women, and indeed that includes black women especially, remain underrepresented across every level of social, economic, and political power in this country. So I could say a lot more, but this means that they still earn less money, despite increasingly being breadwinners of their families. They have more debt, especially for Black women, from attending for-profit institutions that lack accreditation and thus don't give them jobs that could make up for the debt that they have acquired. They have worse health outcomes, including hypertension and stress, uh, which we find is likely tied to racism and so on and so forth. Um, and so I am going to conclude my comments with this. <laughs> An understanding that these disparities persist in part due to the same issues that I began this short talk with, at the fact that women's movements continue to struggle to center its most marginalized members, such as Black women. And this is especially reflected in the issues they take on and champion compared to others. I would add from my own research that many of the existing initiatives to try to change these disparities for women tend to focus on confidence building workshops, resilience training, negotiation training. But what this does is place the burden of the pay gap of not earning more, of being less healthy on the individual and their behavior as if that's the problem and not the systemic structures that made it this way. So as we commemorate 100 years since suffrage, we must remember that it's also 100 years of systemic racism, sexism, and classism that has contributed to the disparities that persist today. And thus, it is only when we take seriously the need to build anti-sexist, anti-racist and anti-classist feminist movements and institutions that we might see real improvements in the lives of all women. And I will stop there. Thank you and pass it on to you, Denise. Thank you so much. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much um, for, for those comments. Colleen and Sally, and, and uh, you picking up right where really where, where Sally left off is the, the fact that today, uh, as we sit here and look at various barriers to the ballot box, we know that all of those barriers continue to this day, 100 years after uh, the passage of the 19th Amendment, and 55 years after the Voting Rights Act Barriers to the ballot disproportionately impact communities of color and women across the board at every level from the process of registering to vote to casting a ballot to having that ballot counted. And, and so um, I want to echo your sentiment that we have much work to do to build fusion and intersectional movements to truly take us to the to, to ensure that everybody's voice can be heard. And, and so I wanna talk just a little bit about some of the, the lessons or takeaways I've taken away from the women's suffrage movement and how we got here and maybe what we can take away from those uh, as we uh, continue to fight um, for the, the right to vote and for the right of all people to, to have a voice. Because really that's what we're talking about here. The vote 
is about something bigger than politics, right? I mean, we're here in the middle of, of the most politically charged election that, that probably we've had in our lifetimes, but it's about much more than, than politics, okay? It's about much more than who you vote for. It is about the ability to have a voice. It's about the ability to have a say in your own destiny. That's really what the right to vote is about. And that's precisely why it is so controversial it's precisely why all the barriers that we talk about all now we're you, you know we're no longer talking about can women vote what we're talking about oh do you have to show photo ID and does that photo ID have to have the same name what if your name has changed because you got married and, and all these other things that continue to um, disparately impact women the right to vote is about having a voice it's about being able to have a say and a choice in your own destiny and that is partly what made the women's suffrage movement so powerful and also what made it so dangerous if you look at um, who opposed women's suffrage, it was the people who feared the ability of women to have control over their own destinies. And when you look at advertisements during that time period, what you see is connections, connecting women's suffrage to promiscuity, mm -hmm. connecting women's suffrage to um, the demise of the family unit, connecting women's suffrage to um, contraception. Right? Because the notion of when you give somebody the right to have a voice and control their own destinies, well, who knows where that's going to go? And if they're controlling their own destinies, then we can't control their own destinies. And um, I have some slides that have some really incredible um, advertisements from, from the time period before women's suffrage, um, you know, that, that, that show, um, it's like, you know, well, when, when women, a pair of pants, when women get the vote, what are men going to wear? Um, pictures of, of, of men in, in aprons, you know, as a cuckold, you know. Um, my wife joined the women's suffrage movement, and I've been suffering ever since. And, you know, the, the house is dirty and the baby's on the floor crying. And, right? And, and it, again, it is about this sort of fear of people having control over their own destinies. But the The right to vote is even about something bigger, build power, power. And that is precisely why it is so powerful. And it's precisely why there's so many interests involved in these discussions about who gets to vote and on what grounds. So um, just a couple of quick takeaways from, from the women's suffrage movement that I find um, kind of fascinating and interesting. Um, first, it's the nation's largest mass movement for suffrage. I mean, women made up half the population. So they were the single largest group that were excluded from the franchise. The suffrage movement covered three generations, almost 75 years from uh, the time that they first gathered at Seneca Falls to To, um, to the final ratification referenda campaigns, 47 state constitutional campaigns, 277 campaigns to get political parties to include planks about suffrage on, on, in their platforms, 30 campaigns to get a presidential party to adopt suffrage yeah. planks, 19 um, successive campaigns in the United States Congress. Um, and, and it was this massive movement that happened both at the national scale as well as on the local scale. And that's very, very interesting as well, right? Um, so just a few other little points here. Not only was women's suffrage the, the nation's largest mass movement for suffrage, but it was also the largest movement of citizens opposed to their own suffrage. Women made up one of the largest blocks of people opposed to women's suffrage. Which is just a very fascinating point. So my, my takeaways from this are um, some of the lessons. And, and these lessons are applicable to um, many of the, the 
equality fights and justice fights that we see today, um, whether it is out in the streets fighting for criminal justice and policing reforms to fights for the right to vote, uh, to fights for the dismantling of um, various systemic barriers um, to full participation and access to education, healthcare, housing, etc. First, this combination of a state and national strategy proved to be the winning one, even though at the time it was a source of great divisiveness because you had this kind of more conservative um, arm of the movement that was really about um, kind of maintaining status quo, but building up kind of cadres of, of people um, in, in the states. And you had sort of a more militant, um, even sort of civil disobedience sort of arm of the movement. Um, you had the folks that said, no, 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 what we got to do is do get this done in Congress um, and get Congress to pass this constitutional amendment, while you had this whole other group saying, no, you know, we should get states to adopt these state platforms. And um, at the end, it was the combination of the two that, that saved the day because once they ultimately got, after 19 successive Congresses, uh, the passage of the 19th Amendment, that had to get ratified by those states. And guess what? They had those networks in place to do that. And they already had people who were aware and engaged and involved. The second sort of thing that I'll add here is this kind of combination of legal and organizing strategies. And this is really fascinating to me as a civil rights lawyer and someone who does a lot of strategic litigation. Um, it's this kind of recognition that the, the law is not the be all end all. The courts, um, frankly, um, have never been institutions that have moved social justice forward. Uh, and, and I sit here today as we're watching confirmation hearings for a new Supreme Court justice and, and, and thinking about how this affects the right to vote the truth is the courts rarely push justice ahead. They are usually behind. Uh, and, and we see this, you know, um, it, even in the suffrage movement, when the courts were sort of tried to be used as this vehicle, even, you know, once the, the 14th Amendment um, was, was passed after the Civil War, no state shall deprive anyone of equal protection under law, right? And you're the 15th Amendment that guaranteed the right to vote um, without regard to race. If the government cannot deprive anyone of equal protection under law, shouldn't that then apply equally to women? And, um, you know, there were numerous attempts to make this case all unsuccessful. Susan B. Anthony voted and got arrested and charged with illegal voting. And of course, right here in my home state of Missouri, uh, Virginia Minor attempted to go vote in St. Louis and her case made it up to the Supreme Court. And she said, equal protection, right? It seems like an obvious argument. And the court said, oh no, you know, 14th Amendment includes all persons, aren't women people? And the court said, yeah, women are people. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean you have the right to vote. Uh, and it really took until, frankly, the mid 1970s before the Supreme Court even recognized um, the role of equal protection when it comes to gender. And the final two points, women were the biggest supporters and largest opponents of, of suffrage. Um, and that's a really sort of fascinating aspect of this as well, right? Because you had some women who, frankly, benefited from these disparities in power. Women who um, had high positions in society because of who the families they were in um, and, and who they were married to. And those folks actually sought to lose their stature in society if, if voting was opened up to everybody. And that's where you got a lot of this rhetoric about, oh, this is going to destroy the family when women get involved in public life. And finally, uh, the final thing I'll sort of add here is this sort of example about how race can be used as a unifier and divider. You know, the women's suffrage movement grew out of, of the abolitionist movement. Uh, women drew inspiration from the abolition movement. Uh, it made them conscious of their own inequality uh, and, and how to sort of turn that into a political movement. And those movements were aligned, women's suffrage and abolition, for a while uh, until the Civil War. And it, then it began to become divergent. And that's when you began to see sort of efforts, A, to exclude women from those post-Civil War amendments, on the one hand, um, thinking Congress would never pass a constitutional amendment that would include women. Um, and then on the flip side, as then the suffrage movement moved forward, race was used um, to, a, 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 to, as, as a bait. Oh, well, you know, now all, all these African-Americans have the right to vote. We need to work to dilute the power of 
the newly enfranchised black vote. If women were enfranchised, they will outnumber the African Americans who are gaining the right to vote and um, all the immigrants who are coming in and um, uh, uh, Chinese who were getting right to vote uh, the challenges the Chinese Exclusion Act. And so um, I think that, that the real takeaway is um, that the fight for voting rights is is not a, a, a one clear trajectory. It, it ebbs and flows. The fight for the right to vote is an ongoing and continual battle in the story of America throughout our nation's history. And each expansion on voting rights and each rise in political power has been met by backlash and restriction on voting rights precisely from people who are threatened by um, giving access to power to, to these voices. And so as we think about today, we're in this national reckoning of who has a right to have a voice, who has a right to have a vote, even in the midst of this pandemic, hundreds of lawsuits going on that really get to the point of what is the nature of this, the right to have a voice and how much can you burden it? And these questions are going to continue to, to, to um, come before the courts, um, but they're also gonna continue to come before legislatures and frankly, the streets. And what the women's suffrage movement tells us is that you need all of those things. The courts alone cannot answer these questions. Frankly, legislatures and Congress cannot answer these questions uh, without broader social justice movements that back them up and make the case for um, why all voices deserve to be heard and why democracy is a better place when all voices are heard. Excellent. Um, thank you all. These were really um, stimulating comments. Um, I've been writing like crazy on my little notebook um, of all the great things you guys are um, helping me think about. Um, before um, we have a little bit of conversation amongst ourselves, I want to remind people um, that you are not only welcome, but encouraged to click on that Q&A box, uh, probably down at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, and put in any sorts of questions. They can be questions for all the panelists. They can be questions for someone specifically. Um, we've raised a lot of issues and had um, some really interesting conversation um, already. And so we'd love to sort of include you um, in that conversation. Uh, but right now, uh, the great advantage of being the moderator is that I get to go first. This has always been my dream with my hand up in class that I get called on first. And so now uh, I get to ask a couple of questions. And so. Um, I have two in, in, in mind in particular. So let me start with the first one, which is um, I want to uh, sort of seem for all of you or whoever wants to speak about um, this theme of sort of masculinity and politics and leadership and, um, you know, the way in which our views of um, who should speak, as Colleen was talking about at the, at the, um, at the uh, World uh, Anti-Slavery Conference in, in London, uh, the issue of um, who is socialized to leadership that I know is really central to, to Sally's research. Um, and Denise's great examples, I know exactly the cartoon she's talking about of, of seeing, mass, of seeing um, women's suffrage as an attack on manhood. It's not just that women would go and vote, but that it, it, it sort of um, uh, would damage everything. And, and this all came to my mind as you were speaking, if only because an hour before this event, Senator Joe Kennedy asked um, Supreme Court nominee Amy Coney Barrett, who does the laundry at her house? Um, because that is something we need to know about a Supreme Court justice when we think about their future. Um, I was actually, um, funnily enough, running to my basement to start a load of laundry so that could be going while I was doing this event tonight because Wednesday night is laundry night at my, at my house. And so, um, this, you know, it, which is a long way of saying uh, ideas about masculinity and about how roles and caring roles in the home are, have not exited our politics 100 years after women gained the right to vote. And so I just wonder if um, any of you, and I'll just let you speak when you want to speak, um, have any thoughts about uh, that today, how it shapes suffrage, and, and what it means for our politics uh, uh, today. I would like to comment. Uh, okay. Uh, first of all, it shouldn't be who wears the pants, as though a man or a woman, but actually both of them can wear the pants. So that let's not even go down that rabbit hole. Uh, the other thing is that, um, uh, let's see, what I want to say is that women have something to add. It can be a different 
way of doing things. I just called the women's suffrage movement the world's greatest bloodless revolution. They, they fought a 72 year revolution, not four years, not five years, 72 year revolution without the gun. They used everything else in the arsenal of American democracy, but not the gun. So the point is that maybe there's an opportunity to move forward in an unusual way, not a traditional way, is um, women have something to bring to the table. And I just want to correct one fact. I heard that 50% of the women, 50% of the population are women. Au contraire. <laughs> They are 51% of the population. And of course, they're not a unilith, but they come with many different ideas. And I love this Shirley Chisholm quote, if you, know, bring, if you don't have a seat at the table, bring your folding chair. Women, you know, we are the people. We, we are part of this process. Others have thoughts on this. You're being polite and not wanting to jump in front of each other. So I'm calling on Sally. Yeah, I'll just quickly say that um, uh, that's part, what you're describing is partly why I care about young people. Um, I think that, you know, those socializations start early I and mean, we could put it out there, you know, a lot of gender, I think we know is constructed and is performative and that masculinity is actually toxic for men too. Uh, and so it's not just being concerned about um, if women are acting in the ways that we think are, to, you know, constructed to be associated with men, but the fact that that also imprisons men from being able to act feminine a center um, and really affects their ability to emote and, you know, do human things <laughs> like request, you know, to be touched and just very basic stuff that's probably good for their physical and mental health. Um, and so I would just, uh, you know, add that I think part of, again, why I care about young people is that it really raises the importance of disrupting um, those constructions pretty early um, so that people can be free to just be. And I'll just stop there. Thank you. Denise, any thoughts? You can say no and save it for another one if you want. I'll wait till the next one. <laughs> um, uh, I promise I wouldn't insert myself, but I will. Um, I, I just wanna pass up, uh, uh, build on one of the comments Sally made. Um, some of the emerging research we're seeing uh, very much in this contemporary time about the costs of masculinity and these rigid gender norms for men um, is the increasing connection between I ideals about masculinity and strength uh, and mask wearing. Um, we know that, um, one of the reasons that men are less likely to wear masks than women is this, this sort of uh, modern connection. Um, this is not new to mask wearing. It's actually true of all sorts of protective health benefits. Men are less likely to get an annual physical. They don't go to the doctor when they don't feel well. All of these things literally kill men um, and certainly make them sicker than they would otherwise be. Um, and so uh, I, I really love how everyone sort of framed this in terms of we have to think about masculinity and femininity um, not just from women's point of view, from, but uh, thinking about uh, men as well. So um, thank you for that. Um, another question I, I, that sort of came up in what a lot uh, you were raising. And so Pauline rightfully started us with um, a little bit of Katie Stanton uh, and the frustration at the, at the World Anti-Slavery Convention in London, this famous event. Um, and as Denise went on to say, the sort of roots of the suffrage movement in um, the abolition movement. We're going to see the same thing in the 20th century where the second wave has its roots in various reform movements, including the civil rights movement. Um, that's sort of well understood. Um, but we also know that these intersectional struggles, as everyone has pointed out, have been incredibly difficult from uh, the struggles over universal suffrage right after the Civil War or Black versus women's suffrage um, through until today. Um, and, and Sally did a nice job of, of helping us think about that particularly with the, um, as she points out, the extremely high rates of higher education attainment among black women, but still sort of these um, struggles for equality in, in other realms of the world. Uh, and so I guess the way I wanna ask this question, is there anything today that sort of makes you hopeful 
um, that we are building movements that, as, as Sally said, um, are truly, you know, across class, across race, across gender, across sexual identity, um, that really see these problems as all one in the, you know, at having similar roots. Uh, and, and what are the things that, that maybe keep you up at night and make you a little bit worried about uh, where we're going in the future? So we'll throw that out and... I'll actually throw that one. So, uh, cause I think it'll, it'll be short and hopefully be, you know, we can go back and forth if uh, there's interest. Uh, but so one, I actually was thinking about exactly that, um, Christina, when I was writing my comments and um, what came to my mind is sort of the current state of the Me Too movement. Um, so while its origin, I think was troubling a little in that, you know, it was, it's, it was started by Tarana Burks and, you know, at the time because celebrities had taken um, sort of over it and put it on this pedestal, it, it took a while for them to be like, this is the person who created this, like decades prior, it's a black woman, she deserves credit. And people were afraid that this was turning into a very similar thing um, as sort of previous waves. And I remember being at a talk where Toronto was like, I like I was impressed that people were like, okay, we'll seek control. It's your thing. You are the leader. Like, tell us what to do. And she made a really, really strong point that, you know, her goal was to create a survivor's movement, that there had never been a movement for survivors specifically. Um, and that mattered because a big issue was that uh, the critiques of sort of uh classic uh, white feminist movements is that the issues that they take on maybe aren't issues that other groups care about or that are extremely centered to those groups. And obviously the issues of domestic abuse and being um, sexually accosted and so on and so forth are issues that I think have a lot of cross cutting uh, concerns and can be an opportunity to collaborate across. And so that's, I think what the mood Me Too movement has the power of, of doing. Um, and, uh, and I'm encouraged by the survivor framework that if people see themselves through that lens, a lot of people can relate to having experiences with people whom they don't want to have. <laughs> um, and, 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 and I think that that could be cross cutting in terms of race. Um, I do uh, think, you know, it's still troubling that, um, you know, when, for that there's still so many really important things uh, where, for example, the um, early suspension arrests of black girls, right? Like they're disproportionately suspended from preschool. Uh, uh, and, you know, uh, that's an issue that black girls uh, disproportionately face. They're the fastest growing juvenile justice population um, in this nation. Uh, and those are things that, you know, you just won't hear come up. They like the ownership has not been taken by uh, women's groups that uh, make claims to care about these issues, even those who care about girls and like girlhood. Um, and so I think that's jarring because I think a lot of people can see, even if you just have a child or if you know a child, <laughs> we were all once a child, right? You can see the problem and the challenge around having your first experience with authority, being, you know, five years old, um, and this being what you learn about democracy, right? Like how you, how, you, how you think about your place as a citizen, right? You learn that in those early stages. And we can see how anyone can be sympathetic to a six-year-old being arrested, which is true. I'm not being hypothetical. Um, and so, um, yeah. And so I think I would expect, I'm worried by the lack of ownership and attention uh, by broader organizations to those kind of issues affecting Black girls. Thank you. Uh, I mean, I, I, I think I echo uh, some of that concern as well. I, you know, I will say that I am um, inspired by some of the youth justice movements that, I, that, that I'm seeing today in um, sort of a variety of realms, um, particularly with respect to, to criminal justice reform and, and policing reform, that these are movements that are, are led and by the voices of young people, by young people of color, by disproportionately women, um, and um, uh, disproportionately queer women, uh, and uh, uh, I, I, it's it, it, whose voices are being 
heralded as the authorities in these movement spaces. And um, that is uh, incredibly inspiring to me, though um, we know that despite, in, in spite of all of that, those very same leaders continue to face a litany of systemic barriers to, to full participation in equality in, 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 in our democracy that um, everybody else who's following them is able to have. But I, I am inspired because it, cause I see these youth movements coming up. They're, they're like super organized and um, they're intersectional. They are able to like connect the dots between, you know, education inequality that Sally's talking about to criminal justice and the school to prison pipeline and the connection to, to voting and the connection to access to health care. Uh, and that's that's pretty amazing to me. And I also am seeing more um, diversity in some of these movements, um, particularly, again, in the criminal justice space after um just, you know, this year after George Floyd's death, you began to see um, a lot more sort of white middle class men coming out to these protests in a way that you had not sort of seen before and ceding power and control to um, to the movement leaders. And, and that um, that inspires me because I, I do think that history tells us that that intersectional movements and fusion politics can be very powerful. If you look back right after the, the Civil War, um, you know, during Reconstruction before, you know, during that short time period before all of the governmental and ex-governmental crackdowns, what you saw was that um, after the passage of the post-Civil War amendments, um, poor whites and African Americans and women banded together in the South and built political power. In fact, elected African Americans to office as a collective fusion movement that included white people electing black people to office, no, not women, right? Um, obviously, because women couldn't even vote, but you had um, in, in, in the decade after the Civil War, a congressional delegation of 16 African Americans. You had over 200 African Americans in state legislative um, seats, which is just incredible to me, particularly when you consider that as a result then of all the backlash that happened as, because of that fusion movement, the extra political, you know, the red shirts and the Ku Klux Klan and all that violence, plus the governmental stuff, all of the, um, you know, literacy tests and poll taxes, that by 1964, a decade, a century later, the year before passage of the Voting Rights Act, there were only three African Americans in the United States Congress. So the power of that, that fusion, like political movement building, um, that also, like, found space to center black leadership um, is incredibly inspirational to me. And I see some of that um, happening in, in some of the, the social justice movement spaces today. And um, that has me hopeful for the future. I loved your comment, especially Denise, about how organized these kids are. I feel like, um, and I know Sally knows this better than I do from her work on education. We raised this generation to be so like the organization kid and belong to every club and organize everything. And they're just going to turn it on us, man. Like we gave them power uh, and they're ready to use it. Uh, Colleen, did you want to make a comment on this one or save for another one? No, I would like to comment. This year we're celebrating the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment. A lot of people call it the women's right to vote. Not at all. It is the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or any state on account of sex. That's a universal idea. It takes, a, it's not a light switch that you flick it on, you flick it off. No, it takes time to evolve. What gives me hope, that only it guarantees your voice, your right to vote. What about all of your other rights? Where are they protected? And that's where I'm excited about the Equal Rights Amendment. 
And that is that Virginia just this year passed it being the 38th state to ratify it. And the bar is really high. 75% of the states have to approve this very simple sentence. Equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or any state on account of sex. I think go for it. And I, I, you know, let's debate it for 200 years. I, you know, we, we're still debating the First, first Amendment. Uh, that's great, 200 years later, where they didn't even have movie theaters back then when they passed the equal, when they had the First Amendment, you know, uh, and you can't cry fire in a movie theater. Well, that's, you know, 200 years spread on interpretation of a law. So I said, bring it on, pass the Equal Rights Amendment, and I'm thrilled that there is one human in the United States who can publish the 28th Amendment, and that is the archivist of the United States. Bring it on. <laughs> Thank you so much. I, uh, this is great because it also um, leads really nicely into some of the questions that we're getting in the Q&A. Um, and so uh, Karina is talking about, Colleen is talking about one specific uh, uh, amendment to the constitution, which as she rightly says, has its roots um, in the suffrage movement, was originally written by Alice Paul in the 1920s. Mm -hmm. um, I wanna uh, talk about other reforms as well. So we have a question in the Q and A about uh, Lawrence Lessig, the Harvard um, uh, law professor's idea of um, a negative vote that one reform we might consider is that instead of Americans just getting to say who they wanted to vote for, uh, they could sort of have a veto. Um, I also want to throw out um, the issue that um, I've been sort of trying to push this year. Um, and I really appreciate how Colleen just reminded us of the actual words of the 19th Amendment, right? And the 19th Amendment is, is copied directly off of the 15th Amendment, right? So those are the same words. The 15th Amendment says uh, race, color, or previous condition of servitude. And the 19th Amendment says um, uh, sex, of course. Um, but these are saying you can't prohibit on these bases. It's not the same as an affirmative right to vote that people like Lonnie Guineer, uh, Martha Jones, the historian, have talked a great deal about. And I guess I'd be interested in hearing what the panelists think about what are reforms that you think are the most important as we look forward uh, in terms of ensuring um, that Americans do have a voice, as you've all sort of so clearly articulated. Um, where would you put your time? There's also our dreams, like I might have a dream of an amendment that's an affirmative right to vote. And then there's the things that I think are actually politically attainable, um, which may be a different question, although we always have to keep you know, going for our ideals. Um, and I see Denise chomping at the bit because she is the voting rights lawyer. So I'm, <laughs> I'm, I, I'm guessing that she has some good ideas for us. And then I'd love to hear from others as well. I do have a few thoughts. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and yes, All for you. You're welcome. <laughs> well, I mean, and first and foremost, yeah, I do believe that we should um, move forward with a constitutional amendment that affirms a fundamental right to vote. You know, I mean, it, the, the, the right to vote is, is contained in more constitutional amendments than any other uh, right, but it's always in the negative. There's no actual affirmative right to vote, and that uh, in and of itself has really um, created a lot of issues and problems. Uh, with respect to affirming people's ability to, to have the right to vote. Uh, and, and so um, there are some people that believe that we should be moving forward to enshrine an affirmative constitutional protection for the right to vote that then would be treated like other fundamental rights, like the right to free speech or like freedom of religion, in which that right could not be in, uh, infringed without a compelling justification by the state. Um, but in lieu of that, we need to be working to make voting more accessible for everybody. I mean, and so um, this means, um, um, you know, rethinking how we vote. Um, you know, the the Tuesday in November goes all the way back to agrarian times. Uh, the, that day is, of election day is tied to the agrarian calendar and the harvest season. And then the time that it took after All Souls Day for people to ride a buggy to the town square. Uh, that is no longer um, the circumstances in which we cast ballots. We need to be able to ensure uh, early voting in every state uh, and without 
having to provide excuses. You know, I live in a state in Missouri where you have to have a reason to cast a ballot before election day, and it's a limited number of reasons. Um, we need to ensure that all voters are able to cast ballots over a period of time. They should not be forced to, to take a day off work, uh, which people have to do. Uh, we should, um, in this day of, of computerization, be able to vote at any polling place in our jurisdiction. Some places already allow this, but many places, including my own state, do not. Um, we should allow voting by mail. Your state of Colorado allows people to cast their ballots through the mail. It is a safe and secure way of doing that. This, these are just some ways that can help ensure that people who currently face barriers because they have to get to work, because of where they work is not close to where their home precinct is located because they have to take two buses to get there, plus pick up their kids or go take care of their aging parent, and that they're simply not able to do so. And that's before you get to the barriers that, of, of identification requirements and onerous voter registration rules. We should have automatic voter registration is the other sort of platform that I'll, I'll promote here. Um, we already inter interact with government um, in so many ways that could channel um, that information into voter registration. Um, you know, when we um, undertake all sorts of activities, we could be fostering and streamlining these government records to promote um, voter registration, obviously giving people the right to opt out if that is what they choose to do. Um, but there's those things alone would, um, would significantly open up access. We need to eliminate um, barriers to voting for people who have past criminal records. Six million people in this country cannot vote because of a criminal record. And when you um, overlay the, the race disparities in the criminal justice system on top of that, you see is a seven times disparity um, that, that it, um, disenfranchise African-American voters because of that. Um, at a very, very basic level, um, people should be, have the right to vote once they are out of incarceration. Uh, and, and, you know, in America, 77% of people who are denied the right to vote because of a criminal record are not incarcerated. They're out, they're living in their communities, they're working, they're paying taxes. Um, and so measures like that and all of the measures that I just mentioned were actually included in legislation that passed the House of Representatives last year um, called HR1, the For the People Act. Um, and and um, it would have provided each of those things um, that I mentioned and then some. And we also have to restore the preclearance provisions of the Voting Rights Act. Um, that also passed the House of Representatives. I had the honor of testifying before Congress in, in support of that measure. That also passed, um, it was a measure called HR4, the Voting Rights Advancement Act. Congressman John Lewis got to bang the gavel uh, when the House of Representatives passed that last December um, before his death this year. So there are, there's already measures on the books that would go a long way to making voting uh, more accessible, particularly for communities who face the greatest barriers to the ballot. Anybody else want to speak uh, on this issue? What what reforms would would sort of continue to advance um, the really broadly framed goals of the women's suffrage movement? I I don't have that much more to add because <laughs> that was quite comprehensive. <laughs> um, so I would just say that I just don't think there's any circumstance under which a citizen shouldn't have the right to vote, um, and that. Um, you know, when people do vote, uh, governments should be responsive. Uh, if people, if government isn't responsive, then it undermines the, the value of it as well. And I, I say that because from a policy perspective, we know that um, not everyone is responded to equally either. Um, uh, and obviously, even if you vote, but there's gerrymandering or, um, other kinds of initiatives by local governments to undermine, literally undermine people's votes, then that affects the power of your vote, right? So voting is important and there's no circumstance under which a person should not be able to vote whether they were imprisoned or not. Um, and separately from that, governments need to respond to all people equally for democracy and voting to matter. And I think a lot of these youth movements that are viewed as like insurgent and, you know, that really question the ballot, I think has a lot to do with that very um, issue around feeling like, you know, what is their participation actually even mean? Um, and I think, you know, that really raises questions about like reimagining like democracy and, and uh, what is it, you know, 
voting voting matters <laughs> if our democracy is something that actually uh, has a promise of equity um, in a way that's even more radical than the original conception of this country, you know, um, and that's when it matters. So all of these discussions, like you mentioned, are clear, low hanging fruit policy things that we need to do, uh, but their power, I think, is going to be undermined if it's the case that our right to vote is conditional on who we are and our response the way the government responds to us is conditional on who we are. Absolutely. I would like to thank COVID. <laughs> COVID is wonderful because there is no way that our nation is going to return to February 2020. We are in an incubator period. And for instance, I'm coming from the state of Connecticut. And if you want to vote absentee simply because of COVID, you can do it. So I th as we all know, states, individual states control their individual rules about voting. So I just think that it, these are, the, we're living in a great time to find out uh, how voting can work. Uh, actually, I cast my absentee vote today. That's the, you know, that's, and I, my only excuse was COVID. Uh, so I think it's an opportunity for change right now. I welcome it. Uh, I, yes, I love this discussion. And, and um, uh, Sally's point really sort of reminded me of a comment I think everyone's made, which is um, this year I've gotten constant questions. Um, did, did the 19th Amendment matter? Do women voters matter? Um, and, and what people want me to say is, yes, here are specific elections that were different, and here are specific outcomes directly caused uh, by women voters. Um, and I see nods on this panel because we all know it's much more complicated than that, right? Um, and that part of the power of women's votes, uh, because of all the things that, both, that, that everyone has sort of talked about, uh, different votes weighing in different amounts, matters uh, in terms of the kind of movements and other sort of pro-democratic, pro-civic engagement things that are happening. So um, we did get Shepherd Towner, which was a maternity and infant care act in 1921. And we did get the Cable Act, which gave women uh, who married immigrants, uh, allowed them to keep their, uh, 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 their citizenship. Yes, it used to be the case that women and only women, they married someone who was a non-citizen would lose their American citizenship. Um, because that's because the people thought that women's votes mattered. Um, and then they decided, oh, women aren't voting that differently. I guess their votes don't really matter and stopped sort of trying to appeal to women voters. Um, and this is of course where movements like the second wave, like Black Lives Matter, like all of these movements that say, no, we're gonna show you what's behind our votes. We're gonna, we're gonna put value and, and other action behind them, I think are so important um, to making suffrage worthwhile. It's just one tool. And I love how everyone has sort of said that. It's just one tool. It's a really useful tool to have. And in fact, empowers lots of other tools, uh, but you really need to have those um, other sorts of things. Um, so the question I guess I wanna ask that I've already sort of started answering myself is, um, and again, building from some of the Q and A questions, um, how do you feel about the legacy of the 19th amendment? We've talked about what it does. We've talked about what it doesn't do. We've talked about it's limiting power, particularly for communities of color. Um, until the 1965 uh, Voting Rights Act, we have a question in there saying, well, what, how legally were black women kept from voting before uh, 1965? And the answer is uh, courts and state and local government, state and local and federal governments uh, passed laws and courts said that they were okay. Uh, I'm laughing, that's not funny. It, that's, it, it very much was a legal uh, sort of system. So I'm wondering if each of you um, want to say something sort of briefly. I want to get to a couple more um, uh, questions and we're getting close to the end of our time here. Um, what you think is sort of that when you think of the legacy of the 19th Amendment, what immediately comes to mind? Colleen, do you want to go first? I'd like to speak in the most broadest. Sure. Uh, I think everybody knows what a person looks like who's had a stroke and how they function being half paralyzed. And that's what I'd like to talk about our nation is that 
a person who had a stroke doesn't function well. You know, half their body is dysfunctional, which affects the other half of the body as well. And in the broadest of terms, I would say that it's really important that this is a nation of the people, for the people, by the people. We should embrace it simply because a body that is strong on both sides makes a strong nation. And that is my broadest feeling. I love that. Others. Yeah, I mean, I mean, obviously the, the 19th Amendment has, is, you know, leaves a tremendous legacy because it enfranchised women. Um, but I, I think like the lessons I take and I look at it as, as a movement, not just as a constitutional amendment, um, is that it really is about these broader movements that work in collaboration with law, the courts, the political processes to actually move justice forward. You know, um, as, as an attorney who does voting rights cases, I, I've never brought a case under the 19th Amendment, uh, even though all, almost all of the restrictions I've challenged in court have had a disparate impact on women. We bring them under the 14th Amendment. I brought gazillions of cases under the 14th Amendment. I brought cases under the 15th Amendment. I brought cases under the 26th Amendment on things that, that impact um, young voters. Um, so, you know, um, in terms of its like saliency as sort of like a legal tool, I, I, um, I'm, not, I'm not so sure, but, if, but as a political tool, it's incredibly powerful. And, um, but not in a vacuum. You know, Const Congress's legislation doesn't exist in a vacuum. Even constitutional amendments um, do not without the, um, the, the, the force of public and, and movements to, to give them life and, and, and breathe context and meaning into them, right? I mean, the passage of the 19th Amendment did not dramatically affect rights for many, many, many women in this country, not just African American, um, but um, Asian Americans who were excluded from the vote by the Chinese Exclusion Act, Native Americans who were legally excluded from the vote, uh, and, and a whole host of others, and then people who were socially excluded from the vote. You know, you didn't see huge turnouts of women after voting after the passage of the 19th Amendment. And I mean, in some sort of unique places, you did uh, discrete places, but you know, there was still a social stigma attached to women involvement in public life. So you don't see the gender gap becoming um, a deal until like the early 90s, right? And, and so it really in, is, I, I think the important takeaway for me is the power of social movements to, to change the law, but then the power of social movements to give them context and breathe life into them and take them to where they really need to be to actually effectuate the, the reality of what that amendment was intended to do. Great, thank you. Sally, you wanna tell us what you think the legacy is? Um, I know we're short on time and uh, everyone is, um, you know, saying really all of what needs to be said. I think um, I would just add, uh, you know, what comes to my mind is um, Ghanaian, this Ghanaian playwright and activist, uh, she has this quote that I use in my work a lot where she says, trying to develop a nation without including women as part of that process is like telling a person to clap with one hand when they actually have two. Um, and obviously in a place like Ghana where you don't have the intersections of race um, uh, to the same extent, it has a little bit more resonance, but I think the 19th amendment it, in intention <laughs> that the idea was thinking about this group um, that wasn't able to participate. Um, and obviously that makes uh, room, just like when we empower queer communities and we empower just other communities, it makes room for all of us to hopefully one day be free and empowered. And, um, and so I think that um, the tensions uh, of that legacy are still with us um, and we're able to hopefully do better by them uh, because of those experiences um, and hopefully not repeat them <laughs> because of those experiences. And so I think broadly, it really puts us in a place to try to create a world um, that is uh, more equitable 
um, and it's, you know, just a future that really um, doesn't undermine any group um, in the ways that, uh, you know, we were and that created a need for the suffrage movement in the first place. May I give a I... shout out to somebody who asked a question, Kathy. Uh, Kathy said, uh, what happened to, uh, what's the legacy of Phyllis Schlafly? Well, I would like to speak very practically. Uh, Phyllis Schlafly was upset about women serving in the military or unisex bathrooms. And the good news is January of this year, I flew to California and my airplane had unisex bathrooms and it didn't fly out, fall out of the sky. And I was participating in the Rose Bowl parade and we had a flyover of a bomber that was piloted by a woman. And guess what? The bomber didn't fly, fall out of the sky. So I, I am an optimist. I think that change is incremental, gradual, but Phyllis Schlafly is an, I, I, an example of how we advance even in a small period of time. I love that you brought up that question. That is so great, thank you. Um, let me, in the time we have left, um, take a couple more um, questions. We've been bringing all of these in different ways uh, in from the, the Q&A. Um, I'm gonna read this one. Um, I'm amazed that in 2020, we still have not realized equality. Is there a characteristic that you think from each of your perspectives has made a difference in our tenacity to continue this battle for an, battle for an obvious value of human equality? Thoughts on uh, this question? I just say that I get a lot of inspiration from the whole movement and my relatives, my, the women in my family, a matriarchy. Uh, you never give up. You never give up. As soon as you give up, you failed. So never give up. And just, you know, I've served 30 years in a legislative body. When I entered, it was 25% women and 75% men. In my district, it's almost embarrassingly 85% women and 15% men. So uh, things do change. And uh, the key to change is never giving up. I will piggyback off that quickly and just say, you know, Angela Davis has a book where she says freedom is a constant struggle. Um, and recently she's been more engaged um, again in a lot of the discussions around the racial uprisings and, you know, it's intersections with COVID and Trump and all the things that are happening in our current world. Um, and, uh, you know, part of the argument um, is essentially, you know, part of what Colleen was saying is that, you know, it is um, a constant uh, thing that you have to fight for that, um, we should expect that our vote will be threatened and that our human rights can be, un will tr people will attempt to undermine our human rights. And that's in part because we are in a country that is uh, built on a lot of these inequalities and acquired a lot of its wealth through these inequalities and is structured by an economic system, you know, which is capitalism that kind of requires some people to be on the bottom and other people to be at the top. Um, and so when you have that kind of structure, it means that people have to keep fighting to affirm their rights and um, affirm their positionality and their humanity. Um, and, uh, and so that is a part of the process. And so I am encouraged by people thinking uh, broader about our conceptions of citizenship and broader about the ways in which we need to um, try to imagine a world where, again, where everyone can can sort of be together. Uh, Denise mentioned earlier how some of the main people against women's rights were women, right? Uh, and that kind of gets to my interest again in sort of the education piece where if our solutions become, you know, women aren't earning as much money because they don't ask versus women aren't earning enough money because the structures are in place that are sexist <laughs> And make it such that they don't earn enough money. If you know, if the frameworks have to shift, the way that we talk about 
uh, change and solutions need to be examined and, and disrupted and removed. Uh, and even the way we think about success, and this is the part where I'll end, we often think about success in terms of these metrics uh, where, you know, a girl, our girls are successful because they completed college. Well, what does that mean if they've endured sexual abuse at school? Um, if they end endured uh, sh racial stress and trauma at these institutions, right? Um, and so just really thinking differently about what we're after. Um, and I don't think we're just after helping women feel more confident or helping them persist if you're a woman, and especially if you're a black woman in America, like you pretty much have to be resilient. Um, you have to persist. <laughs> and so how do we actually disrupt uh, a lot of the fundamental institutional barriers that people experience? Um, and, you know, and that requires us to think differently about, I think the outcomes that we're after, which is I think for everyone to be able to sit equally and freely and not make assumptions that certain people should be here where others should be below. I'll, I'll just end with saying, you know, um, I, I used to work for the ACPLU and, and um, you know, the motto was, is eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. And it's something that I come back to um, all the time because it is a consummate struggle. Um, and, and that's particularly the case in a society, as Sally mentioned, that is structured on inequality where people benefit from that inequality. Uh, and so it is a constant, constant struggle to fight for your rights. But um, that said, and, and the story of our nation is an ongoing struggle for the, for the fight for rights and for equality. It is an ongoing battle. Um, that said, I do think there are like vantage points in history where there are openings um, to disrupt those systems and to rethink some of those definitions. And I think we're in one right now. I really do. Uh, on on a, a number of levels, um, a number of things have converged that I think put us in a place where, um, where we have an opening in the... It, in spite of all of this that is going on or because of all of this that is going on, um, to really rethink and revisit um, what equality means, what having a voice means, and, and what being a participant in, in our communities mean. So let me ask the final question, um, also taking from the Q&A. Um, we talked about women making this leap into uh, becoming voters and the delays and the challenges to that. Um, we've been talking a lot in recent years about women also entering other political roles like candidates and elected officials. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the question asks, what will it take to have the percentage of women in Congress in line with their percentage in the population? Uh, the person actually says, or their percentage of active voters, which means even more than 50%. <laughs> um, uh, what, what is it gonna take to, to sort of get to that, uh, to that next uh, goal. I propose the idea of creating what I call feminist institutions, and I see that as like a framework. Um, and so I see them as uh, like our schools being anti-sexist, anti-racist, anti-classist spaces um, that really do center the things that I'm describing. So Schools should have gender neutral bathrooms. They should have gender neutral uniforms, gen gender neutral hair policies. They should have, you know, if our jobs had great maternity, maternal leave and paternal leave and policies by nature, then I don't think, you know, there would be as much of a struggle to have these percentages shift. But they, we still don't have paid leave, right? So if you actually think about the conception of an institution as like a feminist space, how would it be design designed? I think it would be designed really differently. Um, if workspaces were seeking to do that, if schools were seeking to do that, if Congress was seeking to do that, and I think that that may be viewed as a radical uh, idea, but I don't think people's basic equality is radical at all. I don't think paid leave so that you can work on your children is radical at all. Um, I don't think restrooms that you know associate with the identity that you uh, feel like is you is radical at all. And if we create institutions that center that first and don't just center uh, metrics that are quote unquote race and gender neutral, 
uh, then I think you would have people be able to freely be. And if they can be, then they can exercise the power uh, that they deserve. Yeah, I and mean, we have, to, we have to normalize the dismantling of these structures, right? I mean, that, that create these barriers. And it is, um, I mean, even just circling back to the, to the suffrage movement, it is a combination of social justice movements with um, political action and, and legal action. You know, I mean, you can't, the courts alone aren't, aren't going to solve these inequalities because they just don't rule, you know, I mean, we saw that when women tried to, to fight for the right to vote under the 14th Amendment. No, you know, and, and so they're just not going to do that until society is, is, is there. So we need all of those things, but we do need to, to normalize through um, movement building, the dismantling of these structural barriers that, that, um, that perpetuate inequality. You can pass the Equal Pay Act. We passed the Equal Pay Act a long, 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 long time ago. And women have made incremental gains over that time. Um, and certainly women of color um, are much less, uh, but still make um, a fraction of, of what men make. And it's not just because women are not asking for raises. Uh, there's something bigger beyond that. There's a legal requirement there for equal pay, but then there's social constructs that, um, that, that make it um, socially less acceptable for women to step into those leadership roles and demand the, the compensation they're worth when their male counterparts are willing to do so. And then there are um, systemic barriers that um, limit um, women who have children and who have to go on maternity leave and, and limit their access to education, limit access to, to other sorts of tools of power so that um, they're not able to climb that ladder in the first place. And so it, it is a combination of all those things. It is not simply... Um, getting a law in the books. It's about building out and normalizing those through social justice movements. Um, the vision, you have, we have to envision the future that we want. I would like to add both on Sally's comments and Denise's. Uh, imagine a gigantic pipeline. <laughs> uh, I think women have to just enter that pipeline wherever they are in life and just keep filling that pipeline, filling it, filling it, filling it. Whether you start at kindergarten or you, you, know, you start higher up, but uh, it's the pipeline that feeds all of these institutions and government seats and uh, power. So thank you all um, so much. I, I love ending on that. Um, I was so intrigued by your conversation. Um, I, I went over a little and I'm probably gonna be fired from this job, but that's okay because it's over. Um, so thank you for watching today. Um, linked in the YouTube chat, if you're watching on YouTube and after you close the Zoom session, um, we invite you to participate in a short survey. Um, additionally, uh, preparations are already underway for CWA 2021. Uh, and the CWA relies on the generosity of people like you to make these sorts of events possible. Uh, so please consider making a gift to the CWA uh, at www.colorado.edu forward slash CWA. Uh, I know it's hard to show our appreciation on Zoom, but I know all of you join me in thanking our brilliant uh, and uh, fascinating uh, uh, panelists today. So thank you so very much. Thank you. Thanks for, Thanks for moderating. <laughs> Thank you, the audience. <laughs>